Jeremy Colby. For that and indeed it was in this very room we had one of the 31 hustings we held around the country and it was um, an amazing experience by any stretch of imagination and uh, I, I felt at the end of it that something had been unleashed in people and that was a sense of imagination of what is possible and determination to achieve a just and safer world for all of us and real social justice in this country. And that is why I believe I was elected the leader of this party, and that is what I try to carry out as leader of this party. And it's a real pleasure and a real honour to be here in the Wesley Church. And it, this lovely international flavour that the Wesley Church has about it. So can we thank the Wesley Church for allowing us to be here? So. And I want to thank Andrew very much for what he just said. I heard it outside. Um, but also his incredible work as uh, one of Oxford's MPs. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, the Oxford MP. <laughs> um, fantastic work, fantastic commitment, fantastic ability to represent and engage with people. And we were just door knocking this afternoon. And it's quite obvious that every single door you go to um, knows Andrew Smith, knows what he does, knows his ability to represent them, and knows his total dedication to represent his constituents. Andrew, thank you very much for all you. for the City Council, we have elections coming up for the Police and Crime Commissioner, and so I want to acknowledge and thank Bob Price, the leader of the Council, for the work he's doing, and the work the Labour Councils are doing, and we need to elect a Labour Council so that work can continue. We also, I hope, will support and elect Letitia as the Police and Crime Commissioner candidate, because um, they're not, there's not a position the Labour Party ever sought to have set up police and crime commissioners. They are there, we're fighting all those elections, we're putting forward candidates in all those elections, and where we have Labour police and crime commissioners at the moment, they've often done very good work in bringing in better police training where mental health issues are concerned, doing a lot more about domestic violence, a lot more about policies towards youth, and bringing a sort of civilian touch to overall policing policies, and that is very important. And now we have the question that the government has suddenly thrust upon them of administering the fire service as well. Uh, they didn't want to go there particularly, but that's where the government has put them. I think we should accompany any campaign on this with the defence of our fire service, of the fire service funding, but also a recognition of what they actually do a lot of the time, which is to keep us safe in lots of ways, and that means they should have a statutory duty to deal with flooding and flood protection, because in reality that's a lot of what they do, they don't get funding for it. And I wanted to say on behalf of millions of people in this country, thank you to them for all they did this winter in all the flooded parts of this country. The incredible work they did, working 24 hours a day to try and keep people safe, not one penny of which was paid for by central government, they were expected to just subsume that within their budgets. The whole Thames Valley is it obviously a flood risk along with Yorkshire and other parts of the country. So we need to support them. And I know Letitia is totally behind that campaign. So give your votes to her as well. Is that okay? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, no, this is an election about councils, but it's also an election about a lot of other issues as well. Oxford um, City Council, like every other council in the country, has faced massive cuts by the government. It also is a city that has a wonderful radical tradition of campaigning and supporting people in all sorts of ways. Uh, the campaign that was fought around children's centres is an example of that. The campaigns that have been fought on so many issues surrounding homelessness and other things are exactly part of that great tradition. But if we as a country don't face up to the housing crisis we're in at the present time, what are the long-term effects of it? Put it quite bluntly, a lot of children are growing up in this country in short-term, short-stay, overcrowded, private rented accommodation, which they uh, may have to leave after six months. In some parts of the country it's worse than others, but nowhere is it good. 
Those children grow up in an unstable environment, not knowing what their future is going to be. They, not often, their primary school kids often quite frequently have to move schools as a result of it. Other older children end up underachieving in school. We then end up with um, those people living less successful lives than they might otherwise live. We're bringing up whole, a whole generation of teenagers in grossly overcrowded flats all over the country, again, underachieving in school, sharing all their ill health problems, and again, a debilitating issue that goes with it. It's a long time since Ken Loach made Cathy come home. Sadly, he could make it again in many of the big cities in Britain. And why? Because we have a Tory government that is simply not interested in proper regulation of the private rented sector and proper quality housing standards in this country. I'll give an example of how out of touch this government is. When one of our Labour MPs, Theresa Pearce, MP for Earth and Thamesmead, moved an amendment to the housing bill, an amendment which simply said all property put up out for rent on the private rented market should be fit for human habitation. It's not a lot to ask. They voted it down. In other words, they're saying they don't care about the quality that is there. Now, Oxford has done its best, and Oxford has done a great deal in trying to bring some degree of sense to the private rented sector and how it does things, and I applaud Oxford for doing that. But I want to see us as a party learning the experience in every city, learning the experience of that in every city so that Come 2020, we can roll out a proper programme, not just of regulation of the private rented sector, but also reasonable levels of rent so people can remain in it and have some security in their lives. By 2020, it could be 25% of the population of the whole country will be living in the private rented sector. It's past time that we reached at least the levels of regulation that exist in other European countries. But fundamentally, the issue of housing has to be addressed by building more homes, fundamentally it has to be addressed by building more council homes, and fundamentally it has to be addressed by investing in housing for the good of people as a whole. That means recognising investing in housing does cost, of course, but it creates jobs at the same time, it is an investment in human resources, and it's an investment in better living for everybody. Is it right that in 21st century Britain, there is an increasing number of people sleeping rough on our streets, an increasing number of people begging in seaside towns and leading very difficult lives. Because we have a welfare state with such huge holes in it, they fall through it, through it and don't get any kind of support. What kind of society are we becoming where we tolerate this level of inequality, this level Area. of injustice, this level of misery? Area. It could be very different. We saw exactly what the sense of priorities are of this government in the budget that they just produced. I mean, I thought I was hearing things when I um, heard that Ian Duncan Smith was quoting the words of John MacDonald. <laughs> True. He said, austerity is a political choice. Yeah, he's right. It's a shame he didn't learn it six years ago when he started on his attack on the um, But that budget contained some absolute horrors. The first of which was, of course, the uh, threat to remove personal independence payments from a very large numbers of, number of people. The hurt that that caused for people who rely on personal independence payments in order to be able to live decently and independently, that surely is what everyone deserves the right to do, whatever their disability. Yes. It costs the community as a whole. But isn't that the kind of community we want to live in, where we're prepared as a community to fund that to ensure that people can live decently? He was happy to take that away. The government was happy to take that away. And I met in my office the following day people in my constituency who had been, who are in receipt of this, who were terrified of what was going to happen to them. Okay, the government backed off a bit. But they're still cutting the ESA, they're still attacking benefits, they still have a four billion hole in the budget 
they still have their beady eyes on the DWP budget, knowing full well that the consequence of cutting that are cutting from the most vulnerable people in our society who need and deserve the support of the entire community. At the other end of the scale, what are they doing? Cuts in corporation tax, cuts in capital gains tax, all funded from those people who are most vulnerable and most in need. That is the Tory agenda. That is their sense of priorities. It's not ours. And it never will be ours. Because we are... So the budget then moved on in another area. Now, I'm used to the idea that Chancellor of the Exchequer like to empire build. They like to go into every department and sort of start taking things over. And uh, I was sitting there opposite him, listening very carefully to every last word that um, George Osborne was saying. And um, then he started talking about education. I thought, right, okay. What's this got to do with the Chancellor of the Exchequer? So he then started on this proposal that we should be um, forcing every school in the country to become an academy. Now this is a really odd way of doing things and it has led to some quite incredible opposition to it. Um, when even a Conservative councillor in Oxfordshire, Melinda Tilly, describes it as big brother gone off the rocker, essentially, <laughs> um, saying, well, what, what is all this about? Because it shows a contempt for local democracy, it shows an inability to engage with what a family of local education can do. And uh, if we force every school in the country to become an academy, does it mean standards improve automatically? No. There is no evidence to say that whatsoever. Does it mean we get a better sense of cooperation between local schools and the local authority and special needs, special facilities, all those kind of things? No, it doesn't. What it means is that we take away that control from the local authority, we take away that sense of a community of education and a community endeavour, and we set up a series of competing schools uh, running league tables against each other and ending up with advertising campaigns trying to attract students to them. I'm sorry, I don't see education as a marketplace economy yeah. or commodity for children. <laughs> teachers conference last Friday to discuss these issues with them. Uh, I've never known teachers so angry or so upset, and they were right to be angry and upset. The opposition to this proposal is absolutely huge. We will be part of that opposition to this proposal because I want to see education valued, I want to see education as part of the community, and I want to see a degree of democracy in the way in which education is run. If you hand an academy or a school over to an academy run by a company somewhere else, isn't there an issue here about public assets and public value being handed over to somebody else? Schools are built in trust for all of us for all time. Education is there in trust for all of us for all time. They seem to have forgotten that and handing the whole thing over to these um, academies all around the country. We will oppose it. We'll mount the biggest campaign we can on it. The teachers' unions are going to be doing much of the same. And I get the feeling there's an awful lot of people all over the country simply do not support it, do not believe in it, do not agree with it, and actually want their community, their city council, their borough council, their county council, in, diff in various in different parts of the country, to actually be in charge of education, to bring schools and communities together. So tell you this, when kids study together in local community schools, they tend to get on better together. The community spirit tends to be much better. The whole sense of community and value of education is much greater. So we'll be campaigning on that because we value education for the learning it offers and the opportunity it offers to all. And while we're on with it, later on in life, why, why is it the Tories so hate adult education. They can't ever wait to keep cutting adult education. What have they got against people who maybe haven't done degrees, haven't been at school 
for very long, haven't been to university, but want to go into adult education and learn something else, or maybe want to change career and try something else. They're making it more and more difficult to do it. It was a Labour government that brought in the Open University. It was a Labour government that widened access to university and college education. And it's going to be a Labour government next time round that reopens adult education for all. In the next time. Whilst it left us with this £4 billion um, hole, which um, George Osborne is thinking about how to fill at the present time, um, also failed to address the issues facing our National Health Service. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room is agreed on the National Health Service. It was the finest achievement ever made by this party, the founding of the National Health Service at a time of deep austerity, deep economic problems, that government invested in people in the future and established the National Health Service and built council housing and many other things. We established it as a principle of a human right, the human right to health care. And in um, Nye's town, in Tredegar, there's a sign on the wall there in the Nye Bevan Centre which um, says that he doesn't want to live in a society where a doctor is forced to ask what your income is before they treat you. He was right. He was right then, and he would be right now. I think he would be pretty appalled that the Health and Social Care Act put through requires 49% of all NHS services to be handed over to the private sector. I think he'd be pretty appalled to find that there's a 1.2 billion total gap in our NHS hospital funding all around the country. That gap can only be filled either by selling off assets, if there's any assets to sell, or by privatising services, for which we all pay for at a greater and greater degree in the future. Surely we've learnt the les lessons of the private finance initiative. It's time to invest in health, not let it rip in the private sector and the market. So I want to see an NHS that's directly run as a public service with public employment, not a vehicle for privatising services and sending them out, reducing the level of care available because of the funding problem, and thus slowly, slowly, slowly turning the NHS from being an NHS of universal um, joy for everyone into a health service of last resort for those that can't afford to go private. I've just got this feeling there are many people in the Tory party who would like it to be like that. I read a very interesting book couple of weeks ago by a doctor in East London called 10 Ways to Destroy the NHS. And it ends up with a private health insurance system for the whole country. I discussed this with uh, an American friend on Monday who had been, it was over in Britain, he'd been supporting Bernie Sanders' campaign. And I said, how is it so difficult to get the concept of the NHS across in the USA? He said, because a lot of people simply don't realise how good it is that you don't go through life frightened of getting ill because you can't afford the treatment. You go through life, yes, nobody wants to get ill, but you're not frightened of the treatment because you know it is there because we have a National Health Service. We will defend that NHS till the end of our days because it's the greatest achievement we've got, it's the most civilised thing in this country, it's an essential part of our very being. It needs to be bigger, it needs to be better, it needs to bring more adult social care into it. But as a principle, it is absolutely key to everything that we believe in. Another aspect of the NHS, which um, I think could do with some improvement, and that is the mental health services in this country. Uh, we live in a society where there's far too much stigma surrounding mental health, there's far too little attention paid to the issues of it, and there's far too little recognition of the fact that one in four of us can suffer from some form of mental health condition during our lives. Depression, very deep depression, there's a number of, number of issues we can all face. Um, I was keen that we showed we're serious about this, so I pointed Luciana Berger to be our Shadow Mental Health Minister in the Shadow Cabinet to show that we take mental health very, very seriously. And I think that's had an effect, actually, because the government then suddenly found in the autumn statement £600 million for mental health. Good. 
wish it was more, but good. That's a, that's a some degree of recognition. But as a society, we have to recognise it. Because if we don't, then what happens, particularly for young people, finding it very hard to go through a period of deep stress, not quite sure who to turn to, feel stigmatised because they're about to confess to somebody they have a mental health condition, therefore get worse and suffer. A quarter of, not a quarter, a large number of um, people that take their own lives, that commit suicide, are young men because they can't see any other alternative uh, to them. We have to be able as a society to reach out to all of those people. That means, as much as anything, ending the stigma as well as properly funding a full mental health service with talking therapies as well as necessary emergency beds. I was talking earlier to Letitia about the role of the police in this. Therefore, um, an end to the use of police cells for people going through a mental health crisis, I uh, hope in any circumstances, and better training for police officers and many others to recognise mental health conditions. So there's a whole series of things that we can try to do. Don't think just because we're in opposition, we can't achieve things. We were part of the group that forced them back on personal independence payments. We were the party that forced them back on cuts to working tax credits, which tomorrow morning would have kicked in. They won't now because we defeated them in Parliament on that. We forced them back on um, providing a prison service to Saudi Arabia. That would have been a nice thing to do, wouldn't it? Um, with its human rights record and all the rest. And so, in opposition, we can achieve things. And we've got some very big battles ahead. And there's no bigger battle ahead than the one that um, we're involved in now, and that is on the future of the steel industry in Britain. Mm -hmm. I was in Port Talbot yesterday, meeting the steel workers there. Um, they're going through a trauma. These are people that have worked in that works for 20, 30 years. I met one man who'd been there 41 years, making very good quality steel. He'd seen it, nationalised, privatised, nationalised, privatised, and he's now on his uh, fifth or sixth employer at the same place. And uh, that works, it is now on the list that Tata Steel don't want to continue producing steel. So there we have it, a multinational corporation meeting thousands of miles away in Mumbai, goes through a um, discussion and decides they don't think there's much of a future for the steel industry in Britain and therefore set all those places potentially to close or be sold off. Well, in those circumstances, isn't there a responsibility on a national government to do something about it, to do something to maintain a steel-making capacity in Britain? If we are to be a manufacturing economy, and we are a manufacturing economy in part, then there has to be a steel industry to accompany it. Does that mean challenging the question of um, dumped Chinese steel at below market price or indeed below cost price um, here in order to destroy our industry? Yes, it does. Does it mean um, be a preparedness to intervene and if necessary buy and run the steel industry? or to ensure it's run by somebody who's going to make sure it survives? Is it necessary for a government to intervene and say that the huge railway developments, which I welcome, going on in this country, should be using steel made at nearby steel works or imported from 12,000 miles away? I think, yes, there is a responsibility. And so it was a little bit odd when I wrote to the Prime Minister yesterday morning and said, would you please report Parliament to tell us what you're doing in the midst of this crisis? And uh, despite being in Lanzarote, he managed to write back and, um, and say uh, he wasn't uh, minded to recall Parliament at the present time. So we launched a petition straight away, and uh, as of a couple of hours ago, it got 130,000 signatures on it or something like that. And it's going up very, very fast. So if you haven't signed it, please do, because we want that to go really, really big, to show, yes, obviously, we would like Parliament to be recalled to discuss it, but... That's not the whole point. The whole point is we want the government to intervene to protect those jobs, to recognise the importance of the steel industry and show that they do take seriously the responsibility of maintaining employment as well as maintaining a balanced economy. And so our party 
came into being to bring about security for people, security from poverty, security from Ill, Ill health, security from homelessness, security from unemployment, that means you have to be an interventionist government to run an economy to ensure all of those things are possible. Some of these words have not been heard for a long time, but you're going to hear much more of them because we are very serious about this. We want to develop a manufacturing economy in Britain. We want a green economy. They're not incompatible. We want an economy that does develop and work for all. That does mean intervention. And it does mean that we put all the pressure on now to this government to intervene now to protect the steel industry and defend those jobs there. Why should all those skills of decades and decades be wasted and thrown away just because a group of financiers meeting 6,000 miles away decided they were expendable? Surely democracy has to be You have it. There is a political debate in Britain. There is a political debate about the kind of society we are and the kind of world that we want to live in. A foreign policy dedicated to human rights and supporting people in adversity. A policy of intervention where necessary to ensure we protect jobs and, and communities. But above all, an investment in people. So we, as a party, go forward on all the principles that we fully understand, but recognise where we came from. This party was founded late 19th, early 20th century. The exact dates are dependent on whether you take the LRC as the foundation of it or the Parliamentary Labour Party formation and so on. It's not important. The principle are that you get an lectern that, doesn't, that keeps a book on it and doesn't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and the principle is that as a party we were founded to achieve that degree of social justice. We think we get media abuse now, but the media abuse that the founders of this movement suffered was far, far worse. Far, far worse. And when they were talking, at that stage, not even all men in the country had the right to vote. Women didn't have the right to vote. It was those incredible pioneers, the suffragettes that campaigned for the right of women to vote that won it that uh, then began to widen, widen the franchise. It still wasn't complete then. That franchise was widened. Those people that dreamt of the idea there should be a community responsibility to provide a pension, the state pension, which came in, in, in the 1908 budget. Those people that believed in a national insurance system to protect people against adversity eventually came with the post-war Labour government. Those people that believed that health care was a right, not a privilege, came again with that post-war Labour government. Later Labour governments gave us the Open University. Later Labour governments gave us the Equalities Act and the Human Rights Act. Later Labour governments gave us the Race Relations Act and gave us the criminalisation of racism within our society, gave us Disability Discrimination Acts and so many of those things. None of those things were achieved without enormous effort and enormous struggle. I remember the day at a union meeting many, many years ago when somebody talked about the principle of a national minimum wage. It took us a long time to win it. We finally got there. We now have the Tories trying to play with the language and call what they're introducing a living wage. It's not a living wage. We want a real living wage on which people can live rather than try and subsist and survive. And a benefit system that doesn't subsidise low wages but helps people in adversity and wages that are actually paid properly. These are issues our party has to face. We're now the biggest membership that we've been, certainly in my lifetime. And that membership is mobilised, it's innovative, it's exciting, and it's excited of what we can do, the kind of society we can deliver. But it means we've got to work together to do it. It means we've got to work together on policy development and policy creation. And it means we've got to work together and bring people with us. Bring people with us to achieve decent housing. Bring people with us to defend um, and extend our national health service. Bring people with us to end the gross levels of injustice and inequality in our society. Britain is the most deeply divided country in Europe, with this minuscule number of super rich at the top this routine of budget giveaways to the biggest businesses and the biggest corporations, this routine of the budget 
of cutting local government services, cutting disability allowances, cutting DWP budgets. So we've seen the effects of six years of austerity on the gap between the very rich and the very poor in our society. We could do something very different. We could do something very much better. Let's not wait until 2020 to advance those arguments. So when we're on the doorsteps in this election, advance those arguments. Advance those arguments about what local government can and does achieve. Advance those arguments about the kind of society we want to live in. Advance the arguments that every single one of us can contribute something to our society. Every single one of us has brains and imagination and abilities that need to be unleashed and liberated. You liberate them by education. You liberate them by opportunity. You liberate them by theatre. You liberate them by an arts policy that matters to all. You liberate them by a society that provides real security. Real security is not when you're threatened with eviction every six months, when you're on a zero-hours contract, when you're on short-term working, when you have a government that won't intervene to protect an industry. That's surely the function of what we're about as a party, to make those arguments, to win those people to come with us. So come 2020, we can see something very different and a much brighter future for everybody in this society. Thank you so much. For